the festival was over and the boys were off running for it all. The cabaret was quiet except for the drilling on the wall. The curfew had been lifted and the gambling wheel shut down. Anyone with any sense had already left town. He was standing in the doorway looking like the jack of hearts. Backstage, Molly was playing five cards stood by the stairs. Lily had two queens. She was hoping for a third to mesh her pair. Lily drew another deck and drew up the Jack of Hearts. Big Jim was no one's fool. He roamed the town's only diamond mine. He made his usual entrance, looking so dandy and so fine. Outside the streets were filling up with his diamond mine and silver cane in every walking place. He took whatever he wanted to and he laid it all to waste, but his diamond mines and silver cane are no match for the Jack of Hearts. Hi folks, so tomorrow we're going to do uh, the th chapters 4 through 6 of uh, the Black Jacobins, which is a cracking read. I hope everyone's enjoying it. It's a lot, it goes down smooth, doesn't it? Uh, we're talking about the, uh, the rise of the slave rebellion uh, and also the rise of Toussaint Louverture. Uh, who, who uh, James is making a case as one of like history's great historic figures, uh, which I would agree with. And uh, I really do think that James does a great job of contextualizing like the romantic appeal and, and sort of the intuitive sense of like the man of history, you know, the great men. Like there is something that is narratively soothing and, and uh, engaging about the uh, imagining history as uh, actions of uh, embodied selves and therefore uh, concentrated in the forms of like these great figures. And therefore, and they, they have a, uh, they have a, a role. Their, their individual will is able to count more than other people's in a fundamental way. You know, uh, the consent of all and the actions of all make up a social corpus, but some people get to make more important decisions than others. And uh, then when history starts cracking open and crises emerge, they throw up figures who would otherwise have lain dormant through the social strata. And like one of the great tragedies of capitalism is that it, as it overwhelms uh, all of life and destroys initiative, destroys the capacity for human initiative, for human action to actually affect a change. Capitalism and technology literally strips humans at every level of our autonomy, and that means at the top two. The feudal lords of Europe did not want capitalism to emerge. They acceded to it in an exigent need to compete with each other for resources and power in the closed socioeconomic system, or the, the, closed, uh, the closed order, the Westphalian order of European states. And we're literally stripped of our ability to affect the world around us. Now, we don't accept that fully. That's what ideology is there for. That's what our superstructure is for. Is, is the culture we enjoy, uh, in, uh, live in inverts all values and takes all that's bad and turns it good and gives us an explanation for why things, why we have less power, why our, we're not able to do what our, uh, what our forebearers have been able to do, why we couldn't turn the wheel. And they had some explanations that they carried with them, but there's a fundamental sort of uh, d dimming of one's connection. And eventually you become overtly aware that you're not in control of anything anymore. And then you are defeated. Then you are made into a slave. And it destroys your 
belief in the system sufficient for you to motivate yourself, yourself morally and intellectually and energetically. Like you, you are not able to fix yourself with, with any uh, investment behind a position. And then you are, you are literally disenchanted from the system. And that is where we find ourselves, where everyone at every level has been stripped of autonomy. But these, these jobs still exist. They're still filled with people. We're still here. We're still here. We're filling the same roles, but with less uh, belief in them than ever, less self-motivation than ever. And that is the crisis of American uh, social fabric. It's why people cannot do anything other than the most selfish thing. Because they are uh, fundamentally unable to engage with each other uh, in anything other than uh, the the marketized relationships that have been enforced upon us by technology and time and capital accumulation. No, you can't go come down too hard on the romantics. They were that was a necessary response, and like they provided necessary. Uh, friction. I mean, it wasn't all great, obviously, but you, you can't blame it. It is a humane response to dehumanization. It can, yes, it turns into things like fascism and, and, uh, uh, and nationalism. Uh, it has to. The, that heat has to go somewhere because capitalism is in control. Uh, but no, that the, the tragedy of our age is that it is a romantic. There is no romance. There is no sense that you can affect anything, but there is no belief in anything but the self in its most narrow construction as a as an agent of economic uh, inputs, yummies and yuckies. That is what we have become. And now we're trying to make sense of a world where we are supposed to fulfill these social roles that had historically encoded with them uh, a rituals of affirm affirmation of belief in a system, affirmation of belief in something beyond the self, that's something that was worth, worth um, honoring, that goes away. Because if you're not building anything that matters, if you're not actually responsible for anything. And that's another big part of this. This is highly underrated. Is that one of the reasons that the system does such horrible things to people is not the, the other side of the equation of the, the, these decisions being made by the algorithm. What that means is that the people associated with these decisions who have to execute them as a moral question have to make the choice. They are making a choice to execute. And they, even if they, and yes, you can say, but they could resign. Somebody else will do it. Yes, but everybody has to make a moral Choice and the fact that there's somebody else who will do it means we can avoid responsibility for doing it. And I will implicate myself entirely in this. This is it. This is not. Nobody gets to choose out of this. This is like the Dunning Kruger effect. This is universally applicable. If I don't participate in this machinery of death, someone else will. Therefore. My involvement in this system is superfluous, and that means I don't have any responsibility for what the system does. So that means that I can benefit from an unjust arrangement without ever feeling like I'm an exploiter because the system will go on, and we all know the system will go on regardless of what happens to me. And that feeling is associated traditionally with like the high, being high in the hierarchy where you feel like you actually can control something. The idea that if I didn't do this, it wouldn't happen. You need to have that sense that something else can happen to make it a real moral question for yourself. Like, because we're all going to be averse from self-sacrifice. If we don't have connections other, which we don't, we have had them stripped off of us. We can only believe in ourselves and our pleasure. So then we participate in these systems and we get sorted really demographically and by chance into slots in this machinery. And then we are asked to make choices. And the fact that the choices aren't real allows us more indulgence to do the wrong thing. And now we have a system where the logic of capitalism, the algorithm of capitalism, drives everyone to doing the wrong thing. Drives everyone to universal uh, immorality because responsibility has been taken from them. 
because responsibility has been taken from them. And that is not anyone's fault to feel that. It's real. It really will keep going if you don't stop. Because remember, the dream of a general strike or a mass uprising is a coordinated one. And we can't visualize those. We cannot live in a world where those are things are possible. We live in an era that has killed those possibilities. The same way the 19th century people killed God. We killed the capacity of uh, there to be an overwhelming spiritual uh, uh, overlordship of the individual self. Uh, no. Then there was the hope that there was a, a species consciousness, which is God in another name, that could envelop the self and integrate it. And nope, the answer is no. That's, how, what, that's what we come to uh, uh, understand the world to be when we observe it. So we cannot imagine acting in, uh, universally. We can only act independently. And so our independent refusal to do something will, by definition, not change it. So why don't we just get the benefit rather than somebody who's a jerk? I mean, virtue mongering on the liberal on liberalism, liberal virtue mongering boils down to the fact that these people are accepting hierarchy, accepting perpetuating hierarchy, and have rationalized to themselves that they deserve it more than others, morally. That's be that's because these people are the that's the lingering sense of internet uh, connection. Uh, to other people that, that, that exists in the residue of the death of, uh, of the search for uh, a species consciousness. Uh, that's, more, that's just uh, our guilt, our sense of guilt, our, our, not any sense of love connection, our sense of guilt, which is mediated by that big other that dominates us. And, the, and it was God, and it was then the possibility of a, a class-based uh, humane revolution, uh, a, a, a synthesizing of... of capital to the needs of all uh, that feeling that was associated with that is gone and what was left is liberal guilt the conscience the 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 self projected outward the other that must exist to observe us and to make our uh, individual identity uh, uh, coherent it was God, it was the, the race maybe, the, the, the human race. Nope, now it is just the self because of the domination of capitalism and its dehumanizing effects, literally dehumanizing effects. And so we're all trying to live in this world. How do we make choices that we can really stripped to their essentials, because we're all going to make compromises. Everybody reading this, everybody listening to this, uh, we're reading this, everybody listening or watching this, including myself, everybody participating in politics at this level, is, of course, participating in capitalism in a way, but to greater and less degrees of individual uh, importance, which means greater or less degrees of leverage that could be utilized if it was expressed outward in solidarity and not individually but that requires staying in the system enough to you can't if you can't quit a job because because of the company that you work for and keep the connections to the other workers you have to make a an end you need jobs to live we need to work to live in this system at least for now we'll see if they fulfill the ubi where we can just be pure consumers which honestly might be what ends up happening to those of us on one side of the of when the when the final walls go up, when when the when the uh, laser moats and the drone uh, perimeters go up. If you're on the good side, if you're on the lucky side of that, you'll probably see a, a UBI where where act, uh, where livelihood is at a certain degree uh, detached from labor, so that everybody can consume even though our labor is uh, totally because of in the interior, because of at the end, the hyper exploitation at the, at the inside technology, uh, our labor is superfluous to the system. Now we can just be the consumers because our consumption is what drives it. Our consumption is what keeps the wheel moving. So as long so it's a perpetual motion machine of, des, of greed of individual desire collated by the price signal. There was an actual article by some fucking demonic Christians about how the price signal is proof of God's design. This perfect system for distributing 
uh, uh, understanding of this. Uh, this is their idea of the human mind. A demonic, selfish, uh, um, uh, self-consciousness devoted entirely to self-pleasure. Uh, the, the vision of all seven deadly sins cohered into a will. That's their idea of God's will, the fucking price signal. They're literal demon worshippers. Well, for now, you got to have a job. And then what, do you, what job is it going to be? What obligations do you have to the other people? All these negotiations you make about what to do inform every decision that you make, even though you take many of them for granted, as I do, as we all do. And so our challenge in life, really, and in the, this thing, is to strip moments to the, to the bear and then evaluate what we're where our chain of interests really lie. And the thing is, we can't do that logically. You need to be honing in on other people, honing in on other frequencies to collaborate your instincts. Because you're, when making decisions, you are battling your own body sensations, which are independent of what you think is happening. And that is where you get feelings. Because feelings are the undigested and unrationalized uh, first, like, pass of stimuli from the outside that is what you do to make up the world. But it is not, at some point, there is an inflection of self-consciousness that arises, and that creates a barrier. Because an inflection point cannot be, by definition, at some point, symbolized. symbolized. And then symbols come later, and symbols therefore come not connected. And that is why our feelings are this undigested thing that we try to give words to. And our, and our whole, like, the human search for meaning is echolocating our, our symbols and, our, and our, our hearts and minds are symbols and the feelings that are, generate our symbols into one another. And then harmonizing them and creating symbols that, that transcend rationality and that convey truth, that convey truth of human connection, of of the systemic nature of the universe, of our integration, our fundamental integration into a, a cosmic fabric that means that our notions of like self-interest that we think we carry with us from our genes uh, are fucking illusory. Are illusory. It is a fundamental misapprehension of the universe that is caused by that cap in perception from a feeling... To, to the ability to express feeling, which makes up civilization that we then live in, that builds this black iron demiurgical cage that we are trapped in. And then we can only echolocate against one another. And we are all therefore obligated in every moment to be present enough in our decision, in our bodies, in the, in the time of crisis, that we are harmonizing our feelings to the words we're using to express uh, what we really want to do. Because we're always, as rational beings at the end of history, we're always rational consumers. We're always looking for our best interests, defined delusionally as some sort of uh, individual interest, a pursuit of pleasure that is, by definition, illusory, a pleasure that is never attained. This is the important thing. The, the rational pursuit of pleasure is irrational because pleasure can only ever be pursued. This is basic Buddhism. Lacan talks about it in, in continental philosophical terms. It's, to my mind, it is undeniable. Never seen anybody argue that this is incorrect. Desire cannot be fulfilled. So a, a society based on desire of the individual will never run up against any... Uh, uh, natural boundary will dissolve it in the pursuit of this thing unless our desires are tethered if the thing we desire can be per, uh, can be pursued because we're going to desire things if the thing we desire can be pursued say it's a communion with all like actual communion a sensed communion with the, with all the, a sharing of the hive mind now we can't have that in life you can have moments of it, but they are forgotten as soon as they occur because they cannot be symbolized. 
And, but it, and that is why we are always struggling to understand our own feelings and our own relationship to the, to the divine and ourselves is because we don't know uh, where these things come from. We're just guessing. But that can be pursued uh, beneficially because all that energy, that drive towards the desire that is motivating you, why? It can go towards building something. It can go towards building a thing that involves the uh, thriving of other people whose condition you care about as much as you care about your own condition. That can draw, that, that, that is uh, everybody moving in the same direction in a way that does not require a state. This is what Marx talks about when he talks about the withering away of the state. The state is there to enforce transactions and interactions. Marx's conception is that if you get a situation of post-scarcity, remember, this is post-scarcity. This is, we have accumulated enough capital to work technologically our will on the world with minimal human labor input, which we have absolutely reached by now. The Industrial Revolution and then the Technological Revolution that came after, or the, the, uh, the Silicon uh, uh, Information Revolution that came after it, have given us the tools to do this. And they have given us the cultural tools uh, to to co comprehend a notion of like uh, uh, collective identity. And if we all believed in each other the way we believe in ourselves, in a social context where we're born into no real danger of precarity, never really feeling threat from outside, never having those spiky adrenaline fight or flight relationships established at, at a young age, we never get that. Because for them, I mean, of course, we don't get none of it, but it is a, it is absorbed into an otherwise uh, calm universe of humanity, which is allowed because technology is doing all the really bad work, and the remaining alienating work, the remaining unfun stuff, is shared. Or if there is some sort of division in time, it is paid for in time. Like you got to do. There's shitty work to do. Somebody does it one four-hour. It's like a volunteer shift because enough people, because there's enough technological uh, uh, carrying out of the system, what is left, there's way more people than there are jobs. There's way more people than there are jobs. So you rotate people through the jobs at low levels of commitment. Well, most of the rest of the work is done uh, technologically. If you get to that point, the coercions of the state will be unnecessary. You will have returned to civilization the prehistoric um, uh, police force of mutual consent. You will have, you didn't have, there was no cops, no formal police force, no formal state in a hunter gatherer band because if you didn't do what was good for the group, you were censored culturally one way or another, away from that action over the course of your life because people were paying attention. You were bouncing up against other people. You weren't just flying uh, uh, frictionlessly through a plane of consumer capitalism where all this technology is destroying the world around you and hyper-exploiting people all around you without you being able to inv invest yourself at all. And in that context... All of the mechanisms of state coercion become superfluous. The state withers away. And as Marx said, you, the final state is a formula, a social formula, instead of being towards capitalism, towards profit, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Meaning what people need, they get. And the thing is, you can't. the reason people don't get that when they're trying to conceive, conceive outside of Marxism, why it so seems counterintuitive and wrong to like libertarians who say, well, that means that all the lazy people will just sit around. Well, all, all the people who have ability, the smart people like me, will do all the work. No, because they're imagining individuals living in an isolated capitalist uh, social order instead of people living in a communal social order. There will... Everything you need will be provided because the need can be socially filled. The need under capitalism can never be filled. And so you have to have a hierarchy. There has to be a... If I'm smart, I have to... There's got to be something in it for me to participate in society, to give you my labor, to give you my smarts. 
I have to know that I'm going to get something. And sure, it starts as stability, but then it becomes, uh, I want a boat. I want two boats. I want two houses. And look at these other rich people who are getting even more. I want more of what they have. And that cannot be extinguished. That fire, was, was, it has to be uh, transformed. And so that fundamental uh, fact of, of, the, of the innate suffering that comes with life, the unquenchableness of human desire as the engine of human action, Shows that that action is either being channeled towards humane ends because it is, it is, it is a definition of self. It is a definition of desire that is socially defined, or is it a definition of desire that is can only imagine personal pleasure, either in the direct sensual form one way or another, or the pleasure of relative ease and comfort compared to others. The the uh, the bene the uh, sensation of uh, of hierarchical uh, elevation over others, the fundamental idea that I am higher than other people because if I'm seeking uh, life to be only pursuit of individual pleasure, then I have to define myself individually. And that means I have to hierarchize myself. And I have to ask myself, do I deserve this power? Do I deserve this position so I can feel safe in it? That's also a sensational pleasure. Liberal masochism is a sensational pleasure of capitalism. And all of us are operating out of one or another of those to the degree that we are captured spiritually by these ideas. How have we translated our feelings in our lives? And so the challenge that we all have to face is, how do we change fundamentally? How do we fuse our notion of desire, our, our libidinal energies, to a felt emotional connection to others that transcends the barrier of the liberal subject. That is the, that's the engine of, uh, of meaningful revolutionary action. And I have to say, many people either don't get to this point because they're stuck in liberal pieties of, and ideological blind spots, or even if they think of themselves as like rigorously Marxist, they get to this point and then they lose heart and they say, you know what? I can understand the logic here, but this is this doesn't feel like the world I live in or can live in. I would argue there is a, a counterexample to this. And of course, it's not fucking perfect. It's not fantasy. What it is is it shows that the market is not the ultimate solvent in all contexts with humans now. That there are humans now who can coordinate actions. And of course, you could say it happens everywhere and every day. Yes, and our lives are peppered with humane action generated by a, a felt connection to others it's just it's we don't feel it enough it's too it's not there are places that you that show that given a social context that encourages it you can create this and i would say the example now is yes cuba the fact that cuba survived the fall of the soviet union to me proves proves that between 1959 and 1989 cuban communists did something built a system that then was turned into a mass political organization that put into place structures of power uh, uh, and democratic control of economic uh, forces and distribution of labor and alienation through the system in such a way that when the time came, when the crack of doom came, and the, and, the, and the subsidy from the Soviets dried up under the most immense pressure imaginable, pressure that broke uh, regimes that were much uh, more uh, economically viable and much less close to the United States and its wrath and much less uh, attacked by capitalism and isolated from capitalism, uh, it didn't fucking fall. And the thing is, we would have, if, if they had done it, through violence, if they had cracked down on like this collective revolt of a desire for freedom that you saw in like the Eastern Bloc, it would have been a fucking bloodbath. It would have been Tiananmen Square on a countrywide scale. And the same way that neoliberalism was installed in China at the point of a at the barrel of a gun, 
in a country that thought it, that by that point was trying to build socialist uh, relationships. Meanwhile, in, in Cuba, they kept communism without massacring everybody. Did they use violence? Did they use state authority? Of course. They put people in prison. The, uh, the, most, the, most, the most alienated people left and went to the United States. They have a high prison rate in Cuba, relatively high, uh, and not just political prisoners, just they have, like, they have a lot of common criminals who, who they put in prison because it's a very fucking poor country. But there is a degree of social, uh, of day-to-day -day social enchantment. Day-to-day -day social um, consent, absent the uh, machinery of the state, that keeps people working together. And it's under attack, and it might be destroyed. We've been trying to destroy it for 60 fucking years. But if conditions... This is what I mean when I say this is possible. If you in, if, if, if conditions in Cuba got better, in the sense that they got like brought into supply chains, but not into capitalist supply chains, they were brought into a socialist supply chain. The way that the Russians thought they were going to get hooked up by the Germans after their revolution that never happened. If China, if China, if Cuba got hooked up to a conveyor belt of like economic development from outside that system that was not predicated on, on neoliberalism, that they would turn into uh, the closest thing to like a Scandinavian fantasy social democracy without the uh, inherent racism that is born of being in the colonial center. Like general multicultural, the real synthesis, the thing Marx said would happen the thing that it now feels like a fantasy. It is, in my mind, the germ of it is in Cuba. And for my mind, and to me, anybody who says I'm wrong on this, explain how communism didn't fall after the fall of the Soviet Union when you see what happened in every other fucking communist country. And you see places that did way more to crack down on public uh, violence and emigration that fell. Even Vietnam, who fucking shed their fucking lifeblood and did build a, like a genuine esprit de corps out of the nationalist fight, went neoliberal. They made the choice to 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 give up the long t the idea of 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 a, of a people being motivated by something beyond selfishness. And the thing that and I and I and, and maybe the reason for that is because the United States didn't strangle them so much. Like you could obviously you could honestly argue that the fact that the United States uh, embargoed Cuba is what saved the revolution. It was the fucking fist that made the diamond. Now that doesn't mean at this point that we don't need to get end the fucking uh, embargo because it's literally they're getting to an asphyxiation point. And, uh, you know, the thing about Vietnam is you can say, well, they weren't as embargoed as, as uh, uh, Cuba was, which means that they, they were more engaged in the market anyway, even before they went neoliberal, and therefore they had established relationships. And then, like, a, a way, as a short-term mechanism of, of, of... And the other thing is, is when you're, when you're Vietnam, if China fucking neoliberalizes, you basically have to. Because China and Vietnam, historic enemies. Uh, it was so hilarious how the domino theory, which presided, presided over American uh, the, uh, uh, Cold War policy in Asia, goes into uh, is what domi uh, says that it's supposed to lead to the communization of entire Asia. Meanwhile, a year, or two years after the Vietnamese, um, the North Vietnamese takes South Vietnam. They invade Cuba, they invade Cambodia, and then China invades Vietnam. And so, no matter what you want to do in Vietnam, if China is, is going to uh, liberalize, you have to liberalize. Because you are still 
in a conflict because those both of those communist movements were based in a nationalist movement. And the nationalism, in my opinion, sort of transcends the communism over time as 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 the, the system of asphyxiates uh, under the, the capitalist global system that slowly strangled communism everywhere. And it was the reemergence of, of a potential conflict, uh, a competition with China. If China was going to develop faster, and everyone by, new, by this point knew that capitalism, whatever else it will do, it will help you develop faster. Because it will alienate all of the violence of the system into the market and therefore give create a system where people are uh, consenting to their own destruction because they have abrogated responsibility. So the world system cranks everything up, and it pops off, and there was no resistance. The Vietnamese acceded to it, because there was no more belief. There was no more real belief, or not enough, no, not more or less. It's never, it's never binary. It's always gradations. There's always fellow feeling. There's always a transcendent understanding of the self in every uh, government, in every system, in every social uh, relationship, but it is to greater or less degrees felt, it, to greater or less degrees is symbolized in the mind and given uh, as a name to the feelings we have. And maybe the fact that Cuba didn't have that. Cuba didn't have that. Uh, Cuba was a nationalist project. Or, or I guess you could say that the nationalist, the nationalist stage of the Cuban, uh, in the initial bourgeois Cuban revolution, uh, which was the rebellion against Spain, had extinguished itself, had exhausted its capacity to enchant over the course of uh, the Machado and Batista dictatorships. Meanwhile. The communist movements that took power in Vietnam and in China were part of an overall nationalist struggle. The nationalist phase had already been extinguished in, China, in Cuba. Uh, the people who had dominated Cubans on the island had been Cuban for the entire 20th century by, 1950, by the 1950s. The idea that there was some nation that they could serve, that they should be serving, it didn't have any kind of uh, emotional weight by that point. Meanwhile, service to the nation was a fundamental driver of both Chinese communism and Vietnamese communism. And post-colonial communisms all throughout the, the third world. And that meant that decision-making becomes enmeshed with a national concern. And so when the time comes to make those decisions, what do we do about the market? What do we do about the, the Western wolf banging on our door? They, they choose to, uh, to unleash the virus, to unleash the pathogen that's going to dissolve the social fabric that has undergirded their entire project. Communist, nationalist, it's all going to fall before international capitals. Dissolving gray goo fucking... Uh, singularity side, stripping human agency out of human relationships, replacing them with the machinery of an algorithm of, of profit extraction based on desire. What's wrong with the audio? God damn it, man. These fucking people. Oh, the fan. Oh, I'm sorry. Shit.
Sorry. Uh, it's whatever. My favorite thing people say on the internet. It's whatever. It's United. My, it's my United States of whatever is what it is. It was my United States of whatever. Still sounds like a robot. Well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I hope it, I hope it, it, you can hear it because I feel like I'm making some strong points. So if you want to ask yourself, like, well, why do I, why do I commit to this, why do I commit to this belief, this new belief that there is a, there is a frequency, that there is a homing, there's a homing device in all of us pulling us together that we can hear if we turn it up loud enough. Because the world is organized to dim that. It is organized to make us only hear the most, the most selfish and self-destructive uh, uh, siren desire. The carnality, and, and I don't just, like I said, I don't just mean lust. I mean all selfish desire to, uh, that is not connected to like a greater good. And that is also going to always be there. Like I said, that's not going anywhere. I mean, we're not going to all be bodhisattvas. If we were, we could all just close hands, close our eyes, and we would literally transcend. We would we would wink out the universe in a moment if we could do that. We aren't, we aren't though. We're regular people. We're still driven by desire. But what desire for what? Desire for what? And that is why we must all put ourselves in positions to act meaningfully from a awareness of that homing signal. Signal, Because if we do that at key enough points in our lives and key enough decisions, we can start driving the truck because we can start cooperating. Cooperating. Which is what the only thing that defines anything meaningful. Nobody has politics. Nobody is a political actor to the degree, uh, unless they're acting. This is not acting. This is, this is also contributing to our selfish indulgence. But if you can imagine our degree of technological sophistication and a social order that at key points is dominated by people acting from a felt spiritual connection to the species as a whole. You could move things in a direction that, yes, you would still have oppression, you would still have violence, you would still have conflict as, as the, the various forms of uh, domination that have been inscribed by the malforming effects of capitalism are resist, but you will have a movement in a direction away from catastrophe. But what would make that happen? It's not those people changing their opinions. It's not everybody having a, a thing and then acting at once. It's people every day coming together to move the fucking thing. to believing in the thing enough to move it. And the reason to talk about something like Cuba is just to give another form to our rational, symbolic understanding that we need to have to keep thinking this way. Because this is all about convincing yourself. This is all about hypnotizing yourself. It is about putting on the they live glasses. And I got to say, if Cuba does go the way of Vietnam, if somebody smarter than Biden does decide that the way to smother the revolution is to just turn on the fucking charm and turn on the money hoses, they might, I think over time they would win if there's no other 
um, resistance outside the system, you know, or if, if the system doesn't collapse, without without some other, I need somebody else but Cuba to fucking stand up and resist this thing. It would be, but look at how long it took. Look at how long it would have took compared to everybody else. <coughs> Yeah, I think I've understood uh, fundamentally a just deeply important, um, like fundamental Kuhnian incommensurability between two you know, intellectual factions of the left. I mean, I don't think the left exists, but there are people who engage in leftist intellectual discourse. It's all online. It's all monetized. It's all parasocial. It's it's very gross, but it really is our cafe scene in like uh revolutionary france that's sad but it's true times change things technology changes things more than anything and there are people who all use the same words but mean different things by them like marxist or socialist or left uh fascist all these things People are arguing over definitions because they genuinely don't think the thing means the same thing, but they cannot convey the difference in words. It's, it's, it's a deeper connection that transcends the logic of their position. And I would say that a lot of friction within the left online is predicated on two, one big fault line. In the United States, let me say the U.S. left, people trying to understand how to do leftism in America. There are those who think that the Constitution of the United States represents a transcendent value system generated by the people who made the country. A transcendent positive schematic for human relations. Or you think it was the product of emergent land and uh, trade-based bourgeois justif uh, finding a political sanctification for the rule in a context of common land ownership rather than feudal land ownership, of free real estate rather than feudal, uh, feudal divisions, where, where, the, where, where the peasants could not get the land because land was power, so you can't give the peasants land because that, that, what are you there for? Here, land is distributed relatively freely to any white settler, so power concentrated differently. And they created a system to concentrate it, to give democratic consent to aristocratic rule, to tell the hordes, have them walk around all day thinking that they were participating in these decisions, that they were making decisions. They get to go through the system and think that they're doing their best interests, when in fact, they're inscribing the power of an emerging capitalist class. They don't notice at first because they're getting the free real estate. They're getting to be their own boss. They're getting to be their own little baron. And so they accede to it. And over time, that the form of that deal changes. Once the land runs out, it becomes, well, you can own the stock market, you can get a small business, and you can get a home. After World War II, it's you can get a home. You're a, you're a fucking wage slave now. You sell your labor. You are alienated from your ability to reproduce uh, your fucking life. You are at someone else's will. But, hey, you got a house. That means you have some degree of investment in the system and, and independent of power, even though you're finally, you've are you been cut off from the land. You didn't notice, though. You didn't notice you got cut off from the land. And I do think that that might seem like a pedant, pedantic point, but I really think that if you see a lot of the arguments between people who seem like they should be on the right, the same side, and are arguing about, a lot of the times, about definitions of things, because remember, this is all abstract, nobody's speaking from experience, 
This is all hypothetical. This is all is, is a hot dog a sandwich because nobody has any direct experience of anything. Is that the difference, the ways that people see different issues boils down to, do they think that the Constitution represents anything other than class rule? Now, there are other divisions that fraction off within those divisions, but I think that is one of the most fundamental. And I honestly think a lot of people who call themselves Marxists, if they got it put to them black clearly, would be like, oh, fuck, yeah, you, you know what I do. And it's like, I'm sorry. I don't say, well, the thing is, I don't get, uh, you're not a Marxist. I don't care about that. I don't think it's true. My, my, the way I understand history, built on a bunch of different uh, uh, intellectual foundations, one of them, I think, Marxism, tells me that that's not how it works. So I don't care if it's, if it's socialism or not. I don't care if it's populism or progressivism or whatever the fuck. I don't think it's true. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't imply necessarily that I'm going to be like, well, now I'm going to say fuck the Constitution and fuck America and I'm going to piss on the flag all the time. No, because most people do think the Constitution fucking means something. That's one of the transcendent triumphs of America's fucking propaganda structure and political superstructure was getting people to believe that shit by bribing them. And it is that bribe that mean that is the residue now in people who say, yeah, the system's fucked, rich people are in charge of it, and it's all uh, the class, we need a class, working class people to come together, but along the constitutional grounds. They have missed it. And you don't get at them, though, from saying you're wrong. And that is where I, that's why I say so much of online disputation is harmful. People trying to make these points through debate, all you're doing is solidifying sides because you're not arguing about the real distinction. And even if you came at it like that, you're not going to argue them out of their belief that the Constitution is meaningful because it's deeper than argument. It's deeper than rationality. It's deeper than reason. Because America has a national, had a nationalist movement that had a meaningful impact. Yes, Marx did support the American Revolution as a fundamental development of capitalism. Correct, but it was that's what that. But what that means in practice is that it makes a bourgeois government, which is bourgeois class rule. It, unlike in Europe, is able to gain a greater degree of public ascendancy to that among the important classes, the, the white people close to positions of power, the white people on the hands whose hands were on the machinery, building the country. They were able to buy them off enough to solidify it. And generations of people prospered, first as yeomen, then as pioneers. All of this at the expense of black labor and, and, and Indian land, obviously. That's, but that's the whole thing of capitalism. It puts all the externalities off the balance sheet. And one of the ways it does that is by having these people within the bubble who think the thing works a way that it doesn't, who have seen in their own lives the system work because it's designed to work for them. Of course they think it works. And so then when things start breaking down, as they are worse and worse because the system is breaking down, the ability to give those treats, the ability to make people think the system is working is wearing away. And people are asking, well, what's the deal? And then you get responses. And if you start from the premise of, well, the Constitution's good, therefore these guys are against the Constitution. Who is for the Constitution? Republicans are for the Constitution. These are deeply welded things. They might get disillusioned from the Republican Party, but that's deeper than the Republican Party in their estimation. The Republican Party, they support it as a vessel for their deeper national fusion of the notion of their best interests, the constitutional order, the re patriotic regime of the United States, the identity of an American. But once again, this doesn't mean you can just argue people out of thinking the Constitution is good or saying, I don't like the Constitution, or fuck the First Amendment. Because this is deeper than those arguments, you can't argue them out of that. 
what has to happen is struggle at the level of labor, at self-interest, where at the root of my life, this thing isn't paying off for me. Because it is in the root of the experience that you, that other people who have a different understanding can say, hey, I am in the same six experience. Look at my experience. Look at where I have put my finger of blame. And then watch if enough people come together. Under, this is how fucking unions are formed. I'm just describing class consciousness formation. It is a comparing of notes in the experience of fucking misery. And so all we can do as consumers and producers of political media is treat it as the entertainment it is and only take from it a greater will and desire to apply meaningful action in our lives day to day. I would love to join a union, but that would be a fucking joke. What? I, like I said, I'm a fucking artisan. I don't know. And I'm sorry, any union I would join would be like what? Uh, podcasters? I don't know. If somebody wants to start one, whatever. And the thing about this, like, fundamental, uh, what I like anyway about this, like, takeaway from all this stuff is, is an action call, is that it does the least amount of harm if you're wrong. Because if you do this, what happens? And, 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 oh, no, I should have been online. One, you'll never know. You'll never know if you were wrong. It's only in your head. And two, you are going to find yourself waiting for moments to act uh, and being driven by a desire to help that is going to be hard to overwhelm because, this is the important part, you have withdrawn your libido from this spectacle. You have stopped imagining yourself to be an actor within a political struggle. You have castrated yourself before you've gone online. You put your dick and balls or your vagina in a jar and you went online to entertain yourself the same way and you did not tell yourself that you're being a uh, that you're being a political actor. But if you say, I'm gonna participate in all this stuff. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna make these I'm gonna have these arguments all day and I'm gonna fixate on these things. The, these uh, hot dog sandwich arguments. Uh, if you're wrong about that, if you're right about that, you'll never know. Because everything's just going to keep getting worse, probably. And if there is anybody who fights against it, you're not going to be there. Because you're going to have convinced yourself that anything that actually happens isn't good enough. Because you'll be too scared to, of being wrong to invest in anything. Because in the process of engaging in this battle of ideas, you will have invested yourself in these hierarchies sufficiently to fear more than anything falling. You will have the precarious paralysis of the fascist working class or fascist middle class in crisis. So every actual eruption of meaningful uh, 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 action will be, uh, you will scoff at it, critique it, Maybe support it, but only from afar because you don't want to be wrong. Uh, mad projection? I'm describing myself. What are you talking about? I'm, I'm not projection. When I say, I guess when I say you, I just should assume I mean me. Because I'm still doing this. I'm not in any way politically acting. And the thing is, I feel that. I feel that I'm not politically acting. And so that sensation and my association of that feeling with that thought, it changes the way I interact with the world. It changes my, uh, it changes my decision matrix. But here's the other thing is that if I did do stuff outside of it, I'd still do this. Because I do this for reasons other than a sense of I'm doing things politically. This is, for me, something that has its own reward. But participating in this shit, like at the level of, of content consumption, 
of, of, of consuming the arguments, the arguments that, that make up the news cycle. That is, that is eating Cheetos for dinner, and you gotta, you just have to feel like it. And if you, if you hook up your d dick to this thing, if you hook your genitals up to this thing, it won't feel like it. It'll feel like a delicious, nutritious meal, a balanced breakfast, until your teeth fall out. And the question of what to do is predicated by your skills, uh, your interests, and your position, your fixed position in space-time. What is what your social conditions are, and of course, your entire suite of illusory, individuating personality traits and traumas both the, uh, conscious and unconscious, and desires. But I, I you think you fuse, you fuse the you bring together the two halves of your mind because there is the body mind duality is is it is a perceived thing but it is a perceived separation that hides the fact that it's it's one being the mind and body are the same thing mind is the body and vice versa but there is this line between the two that is my opinion, generated by the literal distance between the exterior of the body and the central sensational trans uh, processing area. And that, like, the transcendent state we seek, what we imagine... The mystics imagine what we hope happens after you die, and what is just what is always there but is not perceived is of that being one thing, and then that one thing being connected to the other thing of the fucking universe. But there is a there is a screen, there is a fucking dividing there that is defined by the physical distance it takes for sensation to be felt, and that is consciousness. That is assigning symbols to feelings without a direct line to where those feelings came from. And we move through life trying to negotiate that uh, barrier, try, try, trying to tear the veil of Maya. And you can do it. You can feel that. But it requires conditions of will and and concentration uh, and and emotional palate and and uh, self restraint that are only possible in certain conditions. And we, the strive I think is the strive to create the conditions where those feelings can be experienced the most frequently. And we're traversing that barrier and trying to uh, will our way to action with incomplete information is what it is. Because at the end of the day, we're guessing. At the end of the day, we're leaping into a void. Every single decision, every single decision on what is around us is a leap into the void. Because we don't really know what we're experiencing. And our consciousness is shrinking its perception even further in order to make it easier to sort everything. Like, uh, we're, we're less perceivers than winnowers down of information as a, as, a, as a body. 
we can perceive vastly more than our brains take in consciously to make up our world, hear more, smell more, but it would be too much. We have to differentiate. And those differentiations are made arbitrarily in the mind. And the thing is, we know that. We have to paper over that awareness. We have to leap beyond our ability to describe what is going on, which is what our symbolic aftercurrent of accumulated consciousness is. It's not, it is, it is arbitrary to our consciousness. There are reasons for every decision. Every decision at every point has a reason for it. But we aren't aware of them. We can't pin them down. And if we can't pin them down, we cannot follow to a, a, a uh, we cannot get a feedback loop that is perfect. There is a signal, there is a noise that accumulates in the signal over the, over the gap. Yes, of course it's a part of the, the physical state. This, these things, these decisions are being made by the body, not by the mind. The body and mind, there is no distinction. Like you're thinking mind, you're thinking this thing. But there is something below that that is still mind. It's just separated by distance from the gathering point. So they're saying it's not arbitrary. See, this is the this is the difficulty of talking about this stuff, because in the sense that there is a cause and effect going all the way through. Yes, obviously it's not arbitrary, but to the point that their mind must make a choice from within a veil of ignorance is also true. So that means it is arbitrary. People are arguing about a damn robot in the chat. What? You fucking nerds. You guys are fucking nerds. All right, whatever. Fuck you. Fuck all y'all. I ain't scared of you. I don't care that I cease making sense. I realize I'm getting to the point where I can't just explain myself anymore because I see it in my head, but I don't necessarily have the words. It's very frustrating. All right. Bye-bye.